Welcome to Make Something with me, David Petrudo. Today we're gonna to take this Harbor Freight engine and turn it into a go-kart racing engine for the stock appearing class. If you're just looking to soup up a motor for a yard cart or a mini bike, check out the new Ghost Motor from Harbor Freight. That motor does not apply to the karting class that I race in. Today we are building a racing engine for competition in the adult stock appearing class. I build all my own engines and have had some success recently. In the past year, I've won three races, three second places, and I've finished second in points for the 2021 season in the league that I run in. Harbor Freight sells two versions of the 212 motor. This one is the 69730 non-hemi. Sometimes they have the non-hemi in, sometimes they have the hemi in. I can tell this is a non-hemi by the part number and the valve cover. I prefer the non-hemi version because there are less clearance issues. Some builders prefer the hemi version. All the parts that I'll be using today are made for the non-hemi version the 69730. Mostly what I need from here is the block, the crankshaft, the head, the side cover, and the pull start. A lot of this other stuff we're going to get rid of. Some of it you can actually sell on eBay and get some of your money back. I don't need the gas tank, the muffler, the air filter, or the carburetor. I buy modified carburetors, so somebody else will get some good use out of that. Like I said, you can sell some of those things on eBay. The stock flywheel can be a little tricky to remove. So I'm gonna stick a crowbar underneath there. You don't wanna crack the block. You gotta be really careful. This is only made for 3,600 RPMs and it's cast iron. We're gonna get this up to around 8,000 RPMs and this is very dangerous. It will eventually develop hairline cracks and when they explode, they are actually very deadly. We'll talk about flywheels more in a little bit, but I'm going to put this billet aluminum one on there later. It's okay to use power tools to take the motor apart, but I never ever use power tools to put it back together. This is the crankshaft and this is the cam. We're gonna use the stock crankshaft and we're gonna replace the cam. That just pulls right out. We are not gonna use that. Somebody else might be able to use that and modify it. I need to take the crankshaft off so I can remove the governor, but before I can take the crankshaft off, I have to take the connecting rod off, which are these two bolts right here. Here we go. So this is the stock crankshaft. We have to use the stock stroke in our rules, so I'm going to reuse this crankshaft. It does have this gear on here that's for the governor, and I don't need that, so this is just friction fit on there. As we're removing the governor, there's gonna be this tiny little washer that usually gets stuck up in there. And you wanna make sure that gets removed because you don't want that flying around in there. And now we need to remove the oil sensor. When you are racing, the oil is gonna get sloshed around. The oil sensor is going to kick on and it's gonna cut off your engine. Not something you want in the middle of a race. Because we took out the oil sensor and the governor, we have three holes that we need to tap and plug. For this front run, I'm just going to take a bolt and a nut and a washer, put that through there and on the other side. I'm also going to use some gasket sealer around there and some thread lock to make sure that never comes off. We are done disassembling everything, so now I'm gonna take some brake cleaner and clean this out really good. This is the stock connecting rod that connects the piston to the crankshaft. The connecting rod takes more abuse than any other part in the engine. It's a very violent movement when it reaches its peak and then it is yanked back down, and then when it reaches the bottom, it is yanked back up. This is not made for 8,000 RPMs, so we replace it with a billet aluminum connecting rod. There's no performance gain with the billet aluminum Aluminum, it's just this is not going to break on you at 8,000 RPM. This is the stock piston. There's nothing wrong with it except it's dished. So I'm going to replace it with a flat top piston and we're going to get a little bit more compression. Because the measurements of this piston is slightly different than the stock piston, this connecting rod is slightly longer than the stock. There's a link to everything that I'm using down below. Before we can connect this to the crankshaft, we have to make sure that our clearances are fine for the crankshaft. So if the clearances are too tight, the metal is going to expand and get hot while the engine is running and it's going to seize up on you and it's no good. Here's the thing. I have never come across a crankshaft that has a bad tolerance, but they are made in a factory someplace far away. Their standards are very low. So apparently every once in a while you come across a crankshaft 
uh, that is not perfect. All I'm doing right now is checking to see if our clearances are to spec using some plastic gauge. So I put that little red piece of plastic in there and I torqued that down to the specs. And I'm not going into detail because everything is in the instructions for this connecting rod. We can see that piece of plastic, it kind of disintegrated, but it spread out. And we're actually going to measure that spread, we are just under 003. So we are perfect for our clearance. So now we do have to make sure that we get that plastic off. Before we install the crankshaft, the connecting rod and the piston, you can see down the cylinder here, there's some cross hatching and that cross hatching is on purpose to hold oil while the piston is moving up and down. I'm gonna do a very light hone job on there just to make sure it is holding oil at 8,000 RPM. So I've got this tool right here. Everything will be linked down below. I'm just going to dip this into some oil and then give it a little hone job. This piston did not come with the rings installed, so I had to put them on there myself. This little tool right here, this piston ring installer, makes that process a lot easier and a lot safer so you don't bend them in any particular way. Now, you can buy specialty rings that are oversized and then you can gap them yourself because there's a little there's a little gap there and that gap is on purpose that gap allows it to spring out and make contact with the cylinder wall if that gap is too big you get blow by and you're going to lose horsepower if that gap is too small you're going to get some binding and that's just going to cause you all kinds of issues so i'm just using the stock rings for this but no there's a whole world of piston ring knowledge that you can research for yourself. On the piston, there's a little arrow. That arrow is always going to point down. And then on the connecting rod, there are two dots on each piece. And those dots need to face each other. And then when you put them in here, you should be able to see the dots. If you can't see the dots, you have it in backwards. I am going to put a little bit of assembly lube on here. Some people like using assembly lube and some people don't. The reason people don't is they don't want this thicker oil to fling in the crankcase. And some people just use regular oil. Depends on who you talk to. This goes in here like this, and that goes in there like that. And then this little clip is going to snap into place. You need a little, a little screwdriver. I like using an ice pick for this. And it makes a nice little clicking sound when it gets in there. And I gotta do the same with the other side. There are a couple different types of ring compressors. There's the spring-loaded kind that will work with various size pistons. I hate them, they drive me absolutely bonkers. They're hard to use. I only work with one size cylinder. And so I have this piston ring compressor that is made for this size cylinder. It is tapered so I can put a little bit of oil in there. And as I drop that in there, it will compress the rings on there and allow it to drop into the block. Gonna oil up the inside of the cylinder. I got my gaps where I want them to be on opposite sides there. And I would drop this into the ring compressor. This is the toughest part of the whole build right here is getting this assembled. Sometimes it, ha it helps to have a buddy just hold that in place. Some of us don't have friends. We got the connecting rod onto the crankshaft. It's time to put on this part of the connecting rod with the oil scoop. This is hard to show on camera, but you wanna torque it down to spec. So a torque wrench is a necessary must have tool when doing this. Because we changed pistons, we had to get a slightly longer connecting rod and we got that piston just below that surface right there. If we used the same length, that piston would have been set back just a little bit and we would have lost some compression. Next thing we need to do is upgrade the cam. This is where a lot of your performance is going to come from. There are dozens of cam choices. I can't help you pick the right one. One, I'm not qualified. And two, it's so personal to your needs and the type of track and the motor that you are building. So you have to do some research. I know talking to other racers in my area and I know from past experience that the small tracks that I run on, this is the cam that I need and that I've had success with. The cam has these lobes on here and these lobes are shaped and sized to give you duration 
and lift. Duration and lift is going to determine how far your valves move up and down, and the more they move up, the more airflow that you can get into there, the more combustion, the more power, the more torque. This is a very aggressive cam as far as the lobes are shaped, but doesn't have a super high lift. I'm going to increase lift using another technique using ratio rockers. This cam has a dot on here and then the crankshaft has a dot on here. I want to align those two dots and it just fits in there. I am going to put a little bit of assembly lube on here. I'm using the stock lifters and I do want a little bit of oil on them so they go back in there. These lifters will connect with the push rods, the push rods will connect with the rockers, and the rockers will move the valves up and down. Then the cam can go in here, lining up the dots. I purchased an extra side cover and have cut it down on the bandsaw so I can throw it on here. It will center the crankshaft and let me know if we have any clearance issues. So I've got that bolted down and now I can start turning this. Nothing is knocking, but a lot of times the lobe of the camshaft will connect with the crankshaft right there. And you have to take a Dremel and file that down a little bit so they don't connect. Even with some heat expansion and some crankshaft flex, we should be good. But just in case, I am going to file that down. So there is one more spot that I think we're fine, but I want to point out and that is where the connecting rod comes up and it gets really close to the block up here. I do think that I am fine, but I'm gonna take a marker and I'm gonna mark that and I'm gonna do a little bit of clearancing on the block just to make sure. What happens is there's internal harmonics within the engine and things start to flex and things heat up and they start to expand. And so you wanna make sure when things get hot and things are flexing, things are not bumping into each other because that could be disastrous. Unfortunately, we gotta take everything back out, take a Dremel to those two areas and put everything back together. That's just the nature of engine building. We got that all back together. The talents are where they should be. And I'm going to put on a new gasket and put back on the side cover. Now, if your rules allow, you can get a billet side cover. And what this does is it stiffens up the whole block. And that is going to increase the lifespan of your motor. Also means you can build up some more compression and your motor can handle it. Our rules do not allow us to use a billet side cover. That's the inside of the block. That's just an overview of what I am doing. There's so much more you can do. You can actually advance or retard the timing in the cam, which is going to move your power band. I think I mentioned the piston rings. You can get low tension rings and then you can set the gap to your needs. So a lot, a lot of more details that you can get into to just get a tiny little bit more horsepower. Like I mentioned before, the cast iron flywheel, no good. You gotta get rid of that. So I have this billet aluminum one here. This is tapered and then the inside of the flywheel is tapered. So the very first thing I need to do is remove this key and then lap that to this crankshaft. To keep the crankshaft from turning, I have this little handy tool right here, which fits on there. You throw a little key on there and then I can turn it, put that in there and that locks the crankshaft down so it doesn't spin. All right, so we're gonna remove the ignition coil cause it's getting in the way. And we've got some valve grinding compound on the inside there. And you can remove that. We'll take some brake cleaner and clean that off because you don't want that anywhere in there. And then we can connect the flywheel. There are a few different options when it comes to your flywheel. This is the light flywheel. There's also the ultra light flywheel that doesn't have the fins on there. I'm gonna have one motor with the ultralight and one with the light, that way I have a choice. The ultralight is going to be really handy on really small tracks. That's going to allow for a greater acceleration. But that ultralight flywheel is not good for bigger tracks because you might have some good acceleration, but it's also going to deaccelerate very fast too, instead of keeping your momentum through the turns. You got a lot of research to do if you're all new to this, but for this particular motor, we're gonna go with the light flywheel. Now your ignition coil is going to go right here. There's a magnet on 
sticking to it right now. There's a magnet on here and the position of this when it's mounted onto the crankshaft determines the timing for your motor. If you throw this key on the crankshaft and throw this on there, you're gonna have 32 degrees of timing. Timing is a whole subject that we're not going to get into, but you could advance or retard your timing and move that power band around for your particular needs. How do you set the timing if you don't have a timing wheel and a gun and everything. So this is a normal key, and this is a key with eight degrees of advanced timing. So if I put this onto the crankshaft, the flywheel is going to butt up against that little cutout on there, and I can get eight degrees of timing. I have other keys, one for 10 degrees, one for two degrees, one for 12 degrees, and one for four degrees. If you have a timing wheel and a timing light and you know how to set the timing, you don't even need the keys, especially if you've lapped this correctly. Once you get this on there, they should mate perfectly. And if you torque this down to proper specs, you don't need the keys at all. So it's up to you. I'm going to put a key in there and I'm gonna put this on at 32 degrees. Our leg allows gasoline or alcohol. So if you are running alcohol, you have to advance your timing more because alcohol burns and combust at a different temperature, it gets complicated. I'm sticking with gasoline, it's just easier. I'm sticking with gasoline. Our leg doesn't allow electric starters, but sometimes I am at races that do allow electric starters and that just saves my shoulder and my neck from pull starting. So I'm gonna put this high torque nut on there and replace the one that came with it. Getting this torque correct is a little hard, so it's just easier for me to go on the floor. That one is definitely hard and you have to have that stop on there. Now that we got the flywheel on there, we can put our ignition coil back on and that has to be a certain minimum distance from the flywheel. So I have my feeler gauges here. Now, when you get your flywheel, it's going to come with these specs. So I'm not going to announce them. Just read the directions. A lot of this is just reading the directions, not not that hard. So that, that magnet is just going to make that stick on there like so. Screw that back in, pull off my feeler gauges. That is the block. Next, we are going to work on the head. This could be a full eight part video series just on this alone, but we're gonna simplify it. So the very first thing I'm gonna do is take off all the parts that's on here right now. If you need to remove the carburetor studs, the way to do that is to take two nuts, tighten those together, and then I can use that to back those out of there. You're gonna notice that one carburetor stud is longer than the other. You're gonna to wanna to replace the shorter one with a longer one because of the air filter and the intake that we're gonna use. And if you need to remove the exhaust studs, same thing. You'll put two nuts on there, tighten them together, and then you can back them out. So we're gonna put a bigger valve on the intake. And so I need to remove the valve seat that's there and put in a new valve seat so we can throw on a bigger intake valve. The bigger the valve, the more flow that we can go through there. You have to match your valve size to the carburetor that you're using. We have to use a stock appearing carburetor. We don't wanna to go too big because you're going to lose volumetric efficiency. There's a lot of science involved. So we're only gonna replace the intake with a slightly bigger valve. This is just a fancy Dremel. Most people will use a Dremel. I like this because it's foot powered. I can also reverse it if I need to. Finally cut all the way through there. That's going to pop out. This is the tool that I'm going to use to pocket out the space for the bigger valve seat. This stem here is 5.5 millimeters. Currently the valve guides in here are five millimeters, which means the stock valves are five millimeters, but the valves that I want to put in there, they're stainless steel, they're upgraded, they're a little bit stronger. They have 5.5 millimeter stems. So I need to bore this out to 5.5 millimeters. So I'm going to drill close to that size, and then I'm going to use this reamer to get it to the exact size. This is a very specific tool just for this job. Because this is a non-hemi head, the valves move straight up and down. So if you have a drill press, this is probably the way to go, but I'm just gonna use my hand drill here and drill that out. Now I'm gonna to switch to my reamer add some oil, 
and ream that to the correct size. Another alternative to drilling that out is replacing them with bronze valve guides. Now, once you put them in there, you still have to ream it with the reamer to the exact size and then do a little cross hatching with this tool right here. To replace the valve guides, it takes this special tool, which fits into the valve, the current valve guide, and then you can take a hammer and knock that out. It is just an interference fit in there. So it's all just held in by friction. Never ever reverse the drill when using a reamer, even when pulling it out. This is made to an exact size and you'll round that over. So now that we have that reamed out from five millimeters to 5.5 millimeters, we can go back to cutting the pocket. These carbide blades are adjustable so they can be moved out to cut bigger and smaller pockets. My new bigger valve seat that has been sitting in the freezer overnight, right now it is on ice. I am going to take a heat gun and heat this up so the aluminum will expand, the valve seat will shrink, and we'll get a nice interference fit in there. I made this little tool on the lathe so I can use that to pound that in there. So I got that heated up. I got the valve seat cooled down. So now that we have the valve seat in there, we need to do a three angle valve job. And what that is going to do is cut an angle on the inside of that valve seat to match our valve. The valve seat has a couple of purposes. The biggest one is to seal off the chamber so you get the best combustion possible. And another one is it removes some of the excess heat from the valve into the head. This takes a very special tool. I have this kit here, which does the three angle valve job. The angle needs to be precise and you want a certain amount of contact between the valve seat and the valve. Lots of videos on YouTube on doing a three angle valve job. It's the same for a car as it is for a go-kart. So you can go look those up if you need a little bit more information. This is just done by hand, no drill this time. We got that first angle. We'll put in the second angle into the tool. Tighten that down. Now that we got that all done, we need to match the inside to the size of the valve seat. Right now, like I can catch my fingernail below there. So now that port matches the size of our new valve seat. It's a little rough, but we're gonna smooth that out in a little bit. We're gonna do a little bit of porting. And when I say porting, all I'm doing is rounding over the edges. Porting is where you can gain a lot of that upper end high RPM horsepower. It's not something I really need on the small tracks that I run. Also, porting is where you can easily ruin the flow of your engine. This is really, it really should be left up to the professionals, somebody who has a flow bench, somebody who has a dyno and they can measure numbers, so, or so just somebody who has experience. All I'm going to do is round over the edges on the intake and the outtake. Imagine if you blew smoke into here, would that smoke hit that corner and cause turbulence and roll over onto itself? Or would that smoke flow through easily like a nice stream of water. Right now there's gonna be a lot of turbulence because the stock head has some very sharp edges in there. So I'm just gonna round them over. I am not gonna do any reshaping of the port size, just rounding over the edges. And then on the outtake, we want as smooth as possible. You can get up to a mere finish if you want. On the intake, we want smooth, but not as smooth as the exhaust. We want, it, it, it should be, smooth to the touch, but it's okay to have a little bit of scratches in there to help atomize that fuel air mixture before it gets into the combustion chamber. Now that the porting is done, really I'm just rounding over the edges, I'm going to polish the chamber. This is just going to help with the fuel air moving in and out. And this is just a little Dremel polishing tool on the end of my spindle. I got all of those corners rounded over and then that polish as good as I'm going to get it for now. Next thing we can do to increase compression is to mill this down. Now, typically you would do this on a mill with a fly cutter that would remove all of this material right here. I don't have a mill and a fly cutter, so I'm gonna show you how to do it with a belt sander. That belt sander is pretty darn aggressive, doesn't leave a super smooth finish, plus it's not perfectly flat. So I have a piece of plate glass here that I'm going to glue on some sandpaper. You don't want this to be a mere 
finish, but you do want it flat and smooth. Next thing I need to do is use some valve grinding compound on the valves to mate them to the seats. These are brand new valves, and this will allow me to see how good of a job I did with the three angle valve job. This is like a liquid sandpaper. So I can stick that in there. I can take this tool here. I'll do one of these numbers. You can tell by the sound when it starts to mate. I can see on the valve itself exactly where it touched. There is an optimum place for that contact on there. Again, there are plenty of videos on YouTube that goes into great detail on lapping valves and doing a three angle valve job. This is just your overview to get you started. Last bit of work to do is to cut a bigger pocket for the springs. The factory springs are like 10 pound springs, maybe 11 pound springs. We're gonna put in bigger 36 pound springs and they have a wider outside diameter. I've got the spring pocket cutting tool mounted in my drill. This stem fits into the valve guide and allows me to cut the pocket. So now that is going to allow a bigger spring. You have to cut them deep enough so you don't get coil bind. And then if you cut them too deep, you're gonna lose some spring pressure. So there are shims that you can put in there to get the right amount of spring height. That is a lot of work for the head. The first time I did this, this actually took me a couple days. The more I do it, the better I get at it. That being said, you can buy heads that are already done. You can find them on eBay or various racing sites where they already have the bigger valve seat in there. They've already got the valve guides drilled for the five and a half millimeter stems. You've already got the spring pockets cut, already ported and polished. So you just gotta look around. I really enjoy doing all of this myself. I like knowing what goes into there and I like being able to say, I did that. I did this here in my shop and that, that means a lot to me. I've won a couple races with motors that I've built. So I know that this works for me. We talked about the springs that came with it. These are the 10 pound springs, not going to be good enough because we changed out for a more aggressive cam. We removed the governor and we put on a lighter flywheel. We're gonna get a lot more RPMs. With a more aggressive cam and more RPMs, you need a higher tension spring. My cam came with a card that recommended 36 pound springs. So that is what I'm putting in here. If your springs are too light, your valves are not going to close. There's not going to be anything for them to push them close, especially up at higher RPMs. If your springs are too heavy, you're putting drag on your engine and your engine actually has to work harder. And if your springs are too light, you're going to get what's called valve float. The valves are not closing. You're going to, it's going to be a very noticeable loss in horsepower in the upper RPMs and you can easily hear it. If I experience floating valves during a race, that means I'm going to have to make some adjustments, either higher tension springs or work on my spring height. So we're going to start with the 36 pound springs and put them in here. This is actually one of the more difficult things to do. 10 pound springs, you can, you can easily squish with your fingers to get them in there to get the retainers on 36 pound springs there's there's going to be some curse words said off camera i guarantee it there's some oil on the valve stems i'm going to go ahead and throw them in there i clean all of this out really good to make sure there are no metal shavings anywhere so now we can throw in our springs these valve retainers go on top and then this has to be pushed down below that little nub there on the valve so you can get the keepers underneath that. Roll up a paper towel and set that underneath there and that's gonna keep that valve pushed up. And I'll just do one at a time. Throw on the spring, throw on the retainer. I've got this tool right here that makes this job a little bit easier. There, we got one in. Got those heavy springs in there, that can be Sometimes that can be a little difficult. So I threw my spark plug back in here temporarily and I'm just going to fill this with water. And what I'm looking for is it leaking down below. It'll, it'll come right out the exhaust or the intake. I'm just gonna let that sit for a little bit. If nothing comes out, we have a really good seal. I really don't know how the professionals do this. I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure if this is a common technique. Somebody showed this to me once and this is how I do it. 
I use the fire ring thicker head gaskets, which means I lose a little bit of compression because this gasket is so thick. You can get thinner gaskets, but I personally have not had the best luck with these thin metal head gaskets. I've lost, I've lost pressure and some seal. And once that happens to me once, I just don't mess with it again. So I like using the thicker fire ring gasket. We're gonna put these dowel pins back in the head. On this particular gasket that I have, doesn't fit over the dowel pins. So I'm gonna take a Dremel and just widen those holes just a little bit so that goes on there. Then you wanna to torque these down to spec. I keep a handy little torque spec sheet hanging up in my trailer. These are the rockers that came with it. These are stamped and just your standard rockers, not made for this application. We are going to install these black venom roller rockers. These have a true roller tip. We're gonna put lash caps on the valves and then this will get seated in there. If you use this style of rockers, you don't need to put the guide plate back in. So I don't need that. These are one to three ratio rockers. That means we are going to get higher lift. You can get higher lift two ways, one with the cam or one with the rockers. So we have an aggressive cam, but it doesn't have a super high lift. So we're gonna increase that with the roller rockers. This is one of those things that a real engine builder can throw on a dyno, find the right ratio rocker, find the right amount of lift and the right amount of duration. So what is duration and lift? Lift is how high the rockers open up, allowing more air fuel into the head. And then the duration is, it's kind of like the, the ramp speed of how it gets to that point and closes from that point. One of the things about using the rockers for lift instead of the cam is the, the motion and the geometry that it causes. It's almost like when you're in a room with two doors and somebody opens one of the doors and the other door slams shut because of that vacuum in the room, these rockers kind of create that helping the airflow through the head. You can have too much lift if you don't have a carburetor that is supplying enough fuel air mixture into your head. One of the reasons why going to an actual engine builder might save you a lot of time and money. I am going to put the lash caps on here. You gotta be careful the lash caps can fall where the push rods go. So I can drop my push rods in here. Sometimes you gotta play with them a little bit so they catch and fall on the lifters. You can tell when they fall on the lifters when you rotate it and they move. And then I can start screwing this part back in. The piston is going to reach top dead center twice in the four cycles. We want it on the compression stroke. Easiest way to find that, put your thumb over the spark plug hole and then rotate the crankshaft and you're gonna feel it push your thumb off. That's the compression stroke. And so right now it's sucking my thumb in. And as soon as, as, soon as it starts to push my thumb off, I can then throw in a screwdriver or anything and then just rotate a little bit more. And it's until when this gets to the top point, you're at top dead center. And you're actually going to feel the crankshaft, it's gonna kind of fall into place when it gets to top dead center. There's like, there's a little bit of play right there. Right? It's like, mm, boom, I can feel it hit right there. This is where you would set your lash. So before I set my lash, I just wanna get this in the ballpark. And as you can see, when I rotate the crankshaft, the rockers go up and down. Now, depending on the type of rockers that you have when you get to top dead center, there should be a slight downward angle on the push rod side of your roller rockers. This angle isn't super critical, it does, um, but what determines that angle Couple things. If you, the, your spring pockets, your shims within the spring pockets, but mostly what people will do is just find the right push rod. So you, you have different push rod lengths. Off camera, I tried a couple different push rod lengths to see if I could get the angle to where I want it. ARC Racing has a whole video just dedicated to push rod length. It's, it's gonna be worth your hour and a half watching that. You're gonna learn so much. So, now that I am in the ballpark and I have the right push rod length in there, I'm gonna find my top dead centered again. It's gonna, there's a little bit of water in the valves from that water test yet, but it sounds all squishy. 
So, all right, it's pushing my thumb off, and right after it pushes my thumb off, it reaches top dead center, which is right there. I'm going to set my lash according to the specs that came with my cam, and I'm gonna set it cold, and then on, after the engine heats up, I will reset it to what it tells me to. So, depending on the type of cam and your engine, you are probably gonna have a different lash setting than me. From here, you wanna make sure you don't have any coil bind. I'm nowhere close, and also, you wanna make sure your rockers are not bottomed out. So I can get a screwdriver underneath here. I can lift that up a little bit so I know I'm not bottomed out. Now that we have the one to three rockers, they're pretty big compared to the old rockers and now they also have more lift. And so when I put on my valve cover, it hits the valve cover. You have two options. One, you can grind away and make clearance for that. The option that I like using is this valve cover spacer right here. So we'll put that on. You'll need to put, that means you'll need twice as many gaskets. So you put a gasket on there, you put the valve cover spacer, and then you put another gasket on there. This spacer also comes with this pulse fitting on there, which means we can use this to our fuel pump to pump fuel into the engine. Otherwise, we would have to drill a hole and then tap that and then put that pulse fitting on here. So that spacer does two things. Another thing that you can do to stiffen up the assembly is use head studs, but our league does not allow head studs. We have to use bolts to put the head on. So if you wanted to stiffen up the whole block, you would use a billet side cover and then you would use head studs. We can't. Never assemble the motor with power tools, always hand tools. Got the spark plug in. Put the carburetor studs back on. Carburetors, a whole nother subject, a whole nother 10 part series that I know nothing about. We use a stock appearing carb, but they're highly modified. There's a new, there's a new low idle jet, a new main jet, a new e-tube, and then this one is the Venturi is bored out a little bit. I don't do any of this myself because they're relatively cheap you know, just a little over $100. There are plenty of places online that you can buy them. I got mine locally, but you can get them from NR Racing or ARC already bored out with the jetting that you may need. This is the insulator plate that comes with your carburetor or comes with the motor from Harbor Freight. I have already gone ahead and taken a Dremel and worked on that hole. That hole should match the hole of your intake because by default, there's not a smooth transition. So I, you, want, you want the easiest access for that fuel and air to get into your cylinder head. So I work on the insulator plate, shape it, do what I need to do, throw on our gasket, throw on the insulator plate, the modified one. Then I throw on the next gasket. This gets confusing to some people. This tiny little hole, we want it on the left side. The reason some people think it goes on the right side is there's a little hole here in the carburetor, but nope, we want it top left. So that goes on there. This goes on there. This goes on there like that. And the next goes the air filter adapter. And then that gets bolted on. This air filter right here is a high flow air filter. You don't want to use the stock one. This one's going to allow a lot more air into the engine. The more air, the more fuel you can get into the cylinder, the better. We got the carburetor, we got the intake on there. Next thing I want to do is install a top plate. This goes on top of the motor where we can put our fuel pump and our throttle assembly. There's a few different versions of this. The version that I like, the one I feel is the easiest to use is this triangular weird shaped one. This is made for the Hemi version. This is a non-Hemi. And so I need to make a slight modification and bend this little guy down so I can mount it on here. On top of this will go a fuel pump. I have this other top plate that I robbed from another cart. I'm just gonna go ahead and use this. I've already got the fuel pump mounted on there. It's just screwed on there. And I'm gonna bend this down and attach it to this. That mounts on there like that. The throttle from the cart is going to go right here. At this point, you should know what you're doing. This first line here, this is the pulse. There's a little P on the fuel filter and that goes to the valve cover. All this is doing is creating a vacuum to the fuel pump 
so the line in can pull from the gas tank and then this will go to the carburetor. There's no gasoline anywhere around here. So I will use a lighter to heat up the fuel line so I can get it around the carburetor. Some people will put a fuel filter here. I may or may not do that later. And then we start adding some ties, make sure everything is air tight. You don't want to suck any extra air. So now we're going to put oil in there and do the break in. There are a lot of theories on breaking in an engine. The way I do it is probably going to be different than the way somebody else does it. Um, one of those theories is a hard full out break in, fill it up with oil, take it on the track and run it as hard as you can. And that's going to help those parts mate together. I don't have the luxury of running at a track. So I'm just going to throw this on my cart, throw it on a stand and just run it for a good 15, 20 minutes. It has to be higher than idle. These engines lubricate the parts with splash. And so at idle, you're not going to get a lot of splash. There's the dip on the connecting rod that goes into the oil and flings it around the engine. So after I put some oil in here, I'm also going to hold the engine upside down and tip it left and right just to make sure oil gets everywhere it needs to go for that initial pull start. And uh, speaking of pull start, I pulled the pull start off and I'm going to use an electric starter today because it's just going to be easier. Another thing you can do is add a little bit of zinc to your oil for the break-in period. It's just going to add even more lubricant to your engine. I don't run this at the races. I only use this for the initial break-in period. Once we break it in, then we're gonna dump the oil out and it's gonna look very glittery as all those parts are mating up. Actually, the next couple of oil changes, I might see some, some glitter in there. Throw on your exhaust, look to see what your rules allow and don't allow, but this has a loop on there to create a little bit of back pressure to help with the flow inside the head. Throw on the chain guard. We got a good break in period. So now I'm gonna pull out all the oil. I'm gonna take it all apart and I'm going to inspect everything, make sure everything looks good. I'm gonna check the cylinder walls to see if there's any scratches in there, see if I need to make any adjustments to the piston rings, make sure the cam is doing what it's supposed to do. Might have to work on the jetting for the carb a little bit, but uh, we're, we're, we're almost there. Gotta take it off the cart and just tear it all apart, put it all back together again. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Down in the description, I'll link all the tools that I use as well as all the parts that I used on my motor. The principles of building this four stroke, one cylinder engine is the same as this eight cylinder engine here. This is just a smaller version of that. You've got intake, compression, combustion, exhaust. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Except here, you just got eight cylinders. So I'm going to rebuild this one next. I'm not claiming to be an expert engine builder and I'm not claiming that all of this information is 100% correct. Racing is a very competitive sport and some of the things that I've learned from other engine builders were told to me in secret and I believe I have not revealed that information here you will almost always get a better performing engine from an experienced engine builder with knowledge in your class and someone who has a dyno and a flow bench. Again, check down in the description for a bunch of resources, including the league and the rules that I race under. And if you're curious, no, I won't build you an engine. I only build them for myself. I will try and answer as many questions as I can down in the comments. And I'm hoping some experienced engine builders will also chime in with corrections and answer questions as well. Thank you for watching and good luck.